All right, so we are here. We are talking about uh, the miracles of Jesus through this series. Again, this is a, a series based on a Bible study that you can find in Right Now Media. And, and so if you need help uh, figuring that out, uh, let me know. But we're going to talk about uh, Jesus <clears throat> calming the storms today. Uh, again, when we talk about miracles, there's uh, the surface level of what these miracles are for. Would they they change people's lives, the people that Jesus is interacting with uh, there in his earthly ministry, and even our lives today, these miracles uh, definitely have a, a lasting effect on people's lives. But the miracles we read about uh, in the gospel stories here in the Bible uh, have another uh, reason for existing here. They have a, the uh, authors had another purpose for sharing them, and that was to show us what the kingdom of heaven Uh, looks like. All of these miracles uh, is Jesus walking around and bringing the kingdom of heaven uh, to everyone that he meets. And so we see healing miracles. Uh, We see miracles of exorcism and we see uh, nature miracles. And the nature miracle is one that we're going to, to talk about today. But again, a major point of these miracles is Jesus showing uh, the people that he is encountering, and showing us here by the witness that we have in, in the Bible what we can look forward to in, in the kingdom of heaven. This uh, miracle we're going to talk about is a nature miracle. And as is my custom, we're going to science class just for a moment. <clears throat> it won't be too long, I promise. But this is uh, Coriolis. I don't know how to pronounce his his first name there. Gaspar Gustav de Coriolis. Does that sound B plus at least? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I want is your praise and approval. (laughs) So I appreciate it. (laughs) So this is uh, Coriolis, and uh, there is an effect named after Coriolis. He kind of the ancient mathematician and discovered this. So I have a picture of the uh, earth here, and uh, basically what the Coriolis effect says is that because the earth is a giant ball, things that are on the equator are traveling faster, are, uh, tr- cover more distance in a 24-hour period than things at the poles because they have a bigger circumference to travel in the same 24 hours that the people at the poles have to cover in 24 hours. So there's a discrepancy between the speed through space that people travel at the poles and people travel at the equator because the earth is a big, giant ball. If uh, anyone is part of the flat earth camp, I don't know... this. Somehow there's an explanation for this works, but, uh, but right now we're going to just assume that the earth is a ball, and this happens because the earth is a ball. Getting back to weather, this has the Coriolis effect then means that hurricanes spin a specific direction because of this discrepancy in distance traveled. So in the northern hemisphere where we live on a round earth, then you go counterclockwise, the uh, uh, hurricanes spin counterclockwise. If you go below the uh, the equator there, then the hurricanes travel in a counterclockwise direction. <clears throat> this is all counterclockwise and clockwise. I'm just making sure you're paying attention. <laughs> this is going horribly so far. So the... Uh, Hurricanes travel opposite directions if if you're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. That's what I get for being specific. So this is the Coriolis effect, right? Pretty sweet. Weird things happen in in nature and in weather patterns uh, based on on some of these effects uh, that happen here in space. So we are going to talk about another Weird thing that happens in nature uh, in this story uh, that Lynn read for us a few moments ago. And uh, so we're going to talk about 
uh, the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, I'll show you a picture uh, shortly, but is a giant a body of water that is normally uh, relatively calm. But we read here that the first thing that happens in this story is that the water is very violent. And I uh, wrote it this way because this is sort of how the, the actual Greek words uh, are formed. It doesn't necessarily say that a, a storm came up, but the Greek kind of says that the, the water became very, and the word is shaky, earthquakey. I said violent because that makes more sense. But, uh, so the water is very violent. That's the first thing that we read. So here's a picture of the Sea of Galilee. This is Capernaum. And so that um, the area there that is, looks like a kind of tiki hut closer to the water is not a tiki hut. It is believed or uh, in, in the uh, tradition that is Peter's home there in Capernaum. And so there's a church built on the spot where uh, historically and traditionally it is said that Peter's home was. Looking more closer to the bottom of the picture, you see sort of this white rectangle ruin thing. That is a, the remains of a synagogue that existed in the time of Jesus. So Jesus very much was in that synagogue, and Jesus most likely was in, in that tiki hut looking thing that is now a church that was Peter's home. Uh, last week, we talked about Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law, and it would have been in that very spot there. But this is the Sea of Galilee then. Uh, 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 that water, that body of water right there is the Sea of Galilee. And you kind of see off in the distance it's surrounded by hills and, 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 and mountains. And so that is the mechanism by which this, these storms are possible on the Sea of Galilee is the winds come over the mountains sort of forms this weird vortex thing, and then they can have these violent storms rise up on, on the Sea of Galilee. If you've ever been to the Great Lakes, there's waves and that sort of thing, right? But, but this has a special uh, topography. That means these storms uh, happen uh, every so often. They have waves that are seven feet high have been recorded on, on the Sea of Galilee. So if you're out there in the middle of the sea on an ancient fishing vessel and these waves are seven feet high and that's, that's certain doom, right? That's, that's uh, trouble for sure. <clears throat> and so we read that Jesus gets into the boat and the disciples follow him as good disciples do into the boat and they, they're heading across the sea to another town and the water becomes very violent. The water is violent and the uh, disciples are freaking out because this is, they are assuming they are going, going to die here. And so they go and they find Jesus asleep on the boat in the midst of this thing, right? I, just doing this, I want to throw up. And, and he's out there, he's asleep during this whole thing. Uh, and so the next thing that happens is in the story is Jesus is there. We read that the disciples go and wake him up and are in a panic. And Jesus says, why, why are you so afraid? Don't you have enough faith? Why are you so afraid? And then Jesus gets up. And after speaking to the disciples, he speaks to uh, the wind and, and to the waves. And he tells them to stop. We, we read here the, the words that we have are Jesus uh, well, I bet, let me get my translation correct. Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Again, the Greek does a cool thing here that says the water is very calm. So the way that Matthew tells the story and the way that it happens is it's got this beautiful Greek structure where the water is very violent. Then Jesus is there. And then the water is very calm. There's a beautiful scene in, scene in The Chosen. Uh, if, you, if you've seen that show or been watching it here with us, where Mary Magdalene is found in the street, healthy and well. And she says, well, I was one way, and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in the middle was him. She's speaking of Jesus. So this is a beautiful uh, 
mysterious, weird, unexpected miracle story where we read about a very violent sea and then a very calm sea. And the thing that happens in between is Jesus. <clears throat> there are a couple things that we can, we can learn about Jesus here from this story. The first is that Jesus uh, here, especially on this boat, and in the lives of everyone that he is bringing the kingdom of heaven to, is a presence of peace. The disciples are freaking out. They are sure that they are going to die here on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is asleep. That says something, then, about his understanding, Jesus' understanding of, of what trouble they're really in. And it says something also about the disciples' misunderstanding about the trouble that they feel like they're in. Jesus here is, is a presence of peace. A lot of times, all the time, I should say, when this miracle is talked about and, and when pastors preach about this miracle, it instantly becomes a miracle of Jesus can calm the storms in your life. And uh, that is true, and, and that's where we're going to go. But we can't forget uh, that this is a, 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 miracle of Je- a miracle of Jesus controlling nature. The storm that is in the disciples' life is a storm with the waves and the wind and the uh, assurance of uh, a certain death here, of drowning in the Sea of Galilee. This is a miracle of Jesus having authority over nature, over the world, over the Coriolis effect, over the hurricanes going clockwise or counterclockwise. Jesus has authority over these things. And so in the midst of this very real storm, and then in the midst of our very real figurative storms, Jesus has full authority. And Jesus then is a presence of peace. Jesus is such a presence of peace that he is asleep. It's a beautiful image of the world freaking out and the disciples freaking out. And Jesus in the center of this, perfectly calm. The same way that the people at the poles spin less fast than the people at the equator, the person that's in the center doesn't move. And Jesus is in the center of the story. Jesus is a a presence of peace here in this miracle story. That's one thing we can learn about Jesus. Another thing we can learn about Jesus here is that Jesus deals with people before problems. So we read here in in the story that that Lynn read to us and and that Matthew wrote for us is that uh, the disciples saw Jesus sleeping and they went and woke him. And the first thing that Jesus does as he talks to the disciples. He doesn't immediately uh, jump up and stop the storm and deal with all the things that are going on. Jesus becomes a presence of peace uh, for the disciples, and Jesus deals with the people before dealing with the problems. Jesus uh, says to them, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Which can sound... Harsh, and it may have sounded harsh uh, coming from him. He's been continually trying to get them to understand that he is uh, the presence of peace here in their lives. He has full authority over nature, full authority over sickness and death. So why are they so still so afraid if they understand who Jesus actually is? Jesus says to them, why are you so afraid? Do you have no faith? And then... Jesus gets up and deals with the storm. Jesus' power over the storm is the same, uh, uh, by the same method. He speaks to the wind and he speaks to the waves. It it doesn't take him a giant incantation or a a song or a dance or anything. But Jesus has full authorities over over the powers of nature to speak to them. The same way that Jesus has full authority to speak to the, to the disciples in the way that he does. Regardless of the words that Jesus may say and how they may hit our ears, the fact remains that Jesus always deals with the people before Jesus 
deals with the problems. The people are what's most important to Jesus. We say all all the time that Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. Jesus has not come uh, to seek and save the institutions or to seek and save uh, uh, whatever problem we may have. Jesus is here to, to seek and save lost sheep, to seek and save people. Jesus deals with people before problems. I want to go back uh, really quick to the Coriolis effect. I say it differently every time, Coriolis effect. It's probably the right way to say it. But this Coriolis effect um, has been said is the reason why in the northern hemisphere, the if you flush the toilet or drain water down the sink, it goes one way. And But then in the Southern Hemisphere in, in Australia, none of us have ever been to Australia, so we wouldn't know, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but it, the water goes the other way because of the Coriolis effect. But, 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 as cool as that sounds and as awesome as that would be, it's not true. Because I thought that my whole life. I'm 43, 44. I'm 40-something years old, between 43 and 46. And uh, that, I don't remember right now. Uh, I'm you know, so many years old. And so uh, that whole time, uh, at least from the moment I learned this fact, I thought, until uh, a couple days ago, I thought that that was true. But it's not true. Like the Coriolis effect has no uh, effect on the way that sinks drain or toilets uh, flush or anything. It's just, you know, the shape of the thing and are there jets pointing one way or the other or... You know, where's the spigot in relationship to the drain? Like, that's it. Coriolis effect has nothing to do with... Uh, has anyone else heard that? That drains spin differently in one hemisphere through that? You've been lied to. Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to tell you. You've been lied to. And this disturbs me because I always thought this was one of the coolest, coolest facts ever. So I'm, I've been disturbed by this for several days now. <laughs> think about it all. I wake up in a cold sweat. So, uh, but, but there, but this, so this is a, a hardship in my life and I will get through it. But, but the reality is uh, that hardships are to be expected. And getting back to our story here of Jesus, we read that Jesus gets into the boat first. And that's very important because we read that the disciples follow Jesus that's what disciples do. That's what we're called to do as fellow disciples of Jesus is to follow him. And when they follow him into the boat, they aren't promised a peaceful voyage to the other side. In fact, Jesus promises the exact opposite, but in this story, he doesn't tell them that. But in following Jesus, we are promised hardship. Hardship because the world is the world and hardship because following Jesus is countercultural, and that will put you in uh, in direct opposition to forces in the world that don't want to hear the story of God and the story of Jesus. And so for several factors, we are uh, we are guaranteed hardship in our lives one way or the other. Your hardship may be Harder than discovering that toilets drain the same way all over the earth? I doubt it, but maybe. But but seriously, we're promised hardships. We're promised hardships, but we're promised hardships following Jesus. And as we see in this story here, that Jesus is the difference between chaos and calm. We will be in the midst of chaos. Both literal storms as this miracle story talks about, and then the figurative storms that we talk about in our, in our own lives. Something as, as frivolous as this, this drain spinning thing or something as serious as life and death. Something as serious as losing your job or not, or not knowing where your next meal is going to come from or, or even uh, mental illness and those sorts of things that cause chaos in our minds. Where on the outside we may look okay, but on the inside we're circling the drain. We can be uh, in chaos. 
And Jesus is the difference between chaos and calm. In this story and in every story of Jesus' miraculous interactions with people, people find themselves in dire straits, in a, in a situation that is not good, in a situation where their life has become chaos. Afterwards, their life is completely calm, and the thing that happens in between is Jesus. Here in the story, we hear that Jesus is the difference between chaos and calm. Jesus has authority to bring calm to chaos. How does that happen, though, for our lives? Because uh, we're not necessarily in an ancient fishing vessel in seven-foot waves. <clears throat> And especially if we're dealing with physical ailments or mental ailments, it can seem like, yes, I believe in Jesus. And yes, I understand that Jesus is the difference between chaos and calm, but I don't don't feel that. And the answer is in Jesus' words to the disciples. Because Jesus says, why are you afraid of the chaos? Don't you have any faith? And that's because faith is the difference between reactive and reliant. The disciples are in a state of being reactive. And Jesus says, if you had more faith, you would be reliant on me right now. Yes, there is chaos. But I am here and I can bring calm to the chaos. If you are rather than reliant, you focus on me. Or rather than being reactive, you be reliant on me. And so that's the difference between us being reactive to the chaos in our lives and us being reliant is putting all of our faith in Jesus. It's saying, I, uh, I see that I'm in a storm right now. I don't exactly know how I'm going to get out of this. I have no way of understanding how God is going to work in my life to get me to the other side of, of this sea. All I can see is chaos. All I want is calm. And I'm afraid. And Jesus, you're supposed to be the difference between chaos and calm. And here in the story, Jesus says, I am the difference between chaos and calm. Your faith is what makes the difference between you being reactive to this chaos and you being reliant on me. So then what do we do when We are in chaos. And I'm not going to tell you that everything that happens in my life, I say, okay, uh, I have faith in Jesus and I have zero negative feelings about this. Uh, I don't react at all. That's something I can't say to you. I react. We all react. But what what I try to do and what Jesus Uh, invites us to do here and what I invite you to do in your own life is to not be reactive and to be reliant. And again, that's nearly impossible. There's no way not to have some feeling about the chaos in your life. But where does your energy go? Where are you going to put your faith? Are you going to put your faith in yourself to see yourself through this chaos? Or are you going to put your faith in Jesus and be reliant on him? And if you can put your faith in Jesus and be reliant on him in the midst of the chaos, you can say, this is a tough business. And I don't want to uh, diminish at all the realities of the chaos that we all go through day to day. And those are very real things. And so I don't want to say that uh, being reactive isn't going to be a response that you have. But the faith part and understanding and being reliant on Jesus is what keeps us calm in the midst of the chaos. We're going to get to the other side. That's a promise. How we react, are we going to be reactive or reliant, determines how we weather this storm. And so what I try to do and what Jesus invites us to do here in the midst of chaos in our lives is say, okay, I'm, I'm here, or this bad thing has happened. 
that doesn't change the fact that Jesus is at the center of this chaos. Jesus is at the center of this rotation, and he's not spinning as fast as it feels like I am. So I'm going to uh, keep focused on the truth and not let myself get so bogged down in the reality of what may have just happened in my life or the financial issue I may have or the physical issue I may have. Don't give that any more power. Don't give that any more of my time and, and, and resource than I give to Jesus. Because if I can give to Jesus and if I can be relying on Jesus and keep my focus there on the center and on the truth, then I don't have to worry about the chaos. It's in the midst of the chaos that Jesus is a presence of peace. It's in the midst of the chaos that Jesus offers uh, solace to people rather than dealing with the problem. And so I invite you uh, today and every day to be reliant on Jesus rather than reactive to the chaos in your life. Jesus offers a peace beyond all understanding. And we have an opportunity to share in that every day. To wrap up here, this is a, a sermon series based on a Bible study from Right Now Media, like I said earlier. And so every Right Now Media Bible study has a study guide that comes along with it with questions to talk about with every 10 or 15 minute video. And you do these over a course of several weeks. And so these are some of the questions that the Bible study asks as takeaway questions, as things to think about. And so I offer them here uh, to all of you. And to myself, as something to think about here as I leave and go into the rest of my week. So what can we learn and take away from Jesus' power over nature? Again, this is a, a miracle story about nature. As much as we always and need to talk about the figurative chaos in our lives, there, this story is first and foremost Jesus' authority over nature, which is almost astounding to think about, but it's a reality. So what sort of things can we learn and take away from Jesus' power over nature? One is that Jesus has more power and authority than we can even imagine. If Jesus can do something like that, then the things that are happening in my life are nothing compared to calming a storm that has come up on the Sea of Galilee. And so what would you do then to offer, to offer this comfort to a friend about the knowledge of God's nearness uh, in, in, in life's storms? You have a friend that's going through something. How do you offer them this calm? How do you help them be reliant? How are you a presence of peace in people's lives? This is what we're called to do as followers of Jesus when we get in the boat is to be a presence of peace. And then finally, what do you do to comfort yourself in the midst of the storm? How do you rely on your faith rather than your own abilities? How do you stay reliant rather than reactive. I gave you one example of something I try to do. But think for yourself. Ask the Lord to tell you, Lord, how can I uh, rely on you? How can I find comfort in the midst of the storms? And in fact, uh, let's do that right now. Well, will you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord, we thank you again for, for the Bible, for an opportunity to be here together and, and talk about uh, the things that you did here on earth. And we ask you now to show us, to tell us, in the way that you speak specifically and specially to each and every one of us, how? How can we be more reliant than we are reactive? How can we lean on you when we're in the midst of chaos? Lord, it's not always easy to see past the wind and the waves. Lord, we have faith in you, but we still need your help. We need your help knowing the physical ways that we could do this, knowing uh, the prayers that you would like us to, to pray, uh, knowing the people that you would like us to call that can be a presence of peace in our lives. Lord, help us know the way to be reliant on you. In the same way, help us to know the people that need a presence of peace. Help us have eyes to see and ears to hear people in the midst of chaos. And even though our own boat may be shaky, help us to be a presence of peace in their lives also. Help us have the words to say 
and the actions to take. Lord, we're here in the midst of various forms of chaos this morning. We all want to be reliant on you, Lord. Help us. We need your help uh, to be reliant. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. We ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask for God the Father to comfort us, to guide us in being more reliant than we are reactive. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand now.